Last week, we were in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and in those verses, uh, we had an excuse for me to use a whiteboard, and so we're going to do that again tonight. And uh, what I'd like to do is a little bit of review, and then we'll complete the story here. So uh, last week, in the first three verses, uh, we looked at uh, Adam and Eve coming to the tree with this decision before them and what happened after. Uh, what, what was it that happened when Adam and Eve took from the fruit and ate and how did they become sinners? And we looked at two historical people to talk about uh, two ways that we can view what scripture teaches. Uh, one is correct and one is false. Uh, the first way is uh, represented by a man named Pelagius in the fourth century. What Pelagius said was that when Adam ate from that fruit, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, he became a sinner on the other side. So Adam here is a sinner. But the only way that he is a sinner is by his action. Adam committed, Adam and Eve both committed an act of sin, and therefore they are sinners because they have sinned, uh, the verb. But this Adam here and this Adam there are the same person. There's nothing that changed in their nature from one side of the tree to the other. Uh, he is a sinner, and he in fact produces sinners, says Pelagius. But these uh, sinners will also only be sinners by their actions of sin. Uh, and that's it. And that's a false view. This is uh, missing half of the story here. And it's only giving us uh, half. So the other person we looked at is Augustine. And when Augustine looks at Adam on this side of the tree, he has Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, one, two, three in his mind. And what he recognizes that scripture teaches is that when Adam uh, ate from that fruit and became a sinner, something tragically different occurred to Adam. Adam, you see, was a sinner, yes, uh, by his action of sin, but also by his nature now. Ooh, that looks awful. Adam uh, is different. Adam has changed. Uh, this Adam doesn't exist anymore. The Adam before sin. The Adam in the garden. Uh, all that we know now, Adam and everyone after Adam, all of the uh, children of Adam, are all alike sinners, both by their actions and by their nature, their very nature. And we live in a world that is affected both, you know, physically and spiritually by sin and by death. So that all of creation and we ourselves are physically dying and dead in a sense and will be completed the day we pass. But we also spiritually are dead in sin. We are totally dead different. We still have the image of God in us, but we are a twisted and corrupted version of humanity. That's what we looked at in the first three verses uh, last week and what sin means for us and what verses one through three mean when they say that we are spiritually dead, children of wrath, dead in transgressions and sins. But tonight we're going to look at the bright side of the story, and that's verses 4 and 5. And the title of uh, the sermon tonight is On Purpose, this, these two words with an ellipsis before, but God. Verse 4 begins with these two words, but God. These two words are the entire reason for salvation. These two words are the great summary statement of the gospel message, of the Bible's message, of story after story through all of biblical history. These three little dots, this ellipsis, describe everything else that we see in the world today. They describe how Adam fell into sin and how mankind from Adam forward 
produced the tragic history of man, produced every awful atrocity, produced the, the lost state of sinfulness and deadness in every sin committed through uh, every event of human history forward. But everything changed because of those two words. God acting in history for us. That's what we're going to look at in verses 4 through 5 tonight. And so let's read together as we dive in this evening. Now tonight I am going to change things up a little bit. Um, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. There's a good reason for that. I want to stick with the NIV um, because that's the translation we use uh, when we're preaching morning and evening. However, these two verses tonight, there's just too many uh, too many things to go back and forth explaining, and I, I, I really like the ESV. It sticks closer to the Greek uh, in the structure of the verses, and I want you to hear them that way. So I'll explain the differences between ESV and NIV, or the Greek structure and the NIV. But I want you to hear them too. So tonight I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, and uh, here's what the passage says, verse 4. But God... Being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let me read that one more time. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In these two verses, I think we see several things, but I'm going to outline four uh, things that these two words mean for our salvation. The first is this. But God the Father is immeasurably rich in mercy. We were dead in sin. We were lost sinners. But God the Father is immeasurably rich in mercy. We see this at the very beginning of verse 4. It says, but God being rich in mercy. Now, in the NIV, here's where we're going to run into some differences here. In the NIV, it says, but because of, the great, because of his great love, God being rich in mercy. NIV moves things around a little bit to try to make it uh, a little uh, cleaner in English. But in the original Greek, it, it reads just like the ESV has it. Uh, but God. And, and I like this in particular because um, I, I think all through Scripture, and, and here is one of those places, we often see that uh, God is the, the first actor. And, and God, uh, here in the passage, also it describes himself. God being rich in mercy uh, the very first uh, thing said in this passage, uh, before it even gets to him acting to save us, is a description of who God is. And it might be a little too much to press this point uh, in, in the grammar of the sentence here, but I, I think there is something to it. I think there is something to the fact that the scripture here, and in several other places we see through the scriptures, uh, we often are given a picture of who God is before we are told what he does. Uh, The whole book of Ephesians is that. Uh, Ephesians 1 through 3 is a picture of who God is and and what he has done before we get into what we are supposed to do. So in any case, uh, I I just like uh, the grammar, and and, uh, it's the original uh, Greek construction, and so it's not a bad idea to go back to that as often as we can. Um, So, God being rich in mercy. What does that mean? Well, mercy... Uh, means kindness or concern uh, for someone in need. Uh, mercy is uh, stepping to meet a need in that someone, for someone who is helpless or someone who is uh, destitute or someone who just has a need you want to uh, help to meet. And often uh, it's used in context where someone is suffering a difficulty or a, dis- a dis- disaster or a misfortune that's undeserved. Uh, Often that's the way that this word is used. And in the New Testament, the best example of showing mercy is actually the story that um, uh, Pastor Tom has kind of started out with his message in the the morning, uh, the morning series, in the Good Samaritan. 
Uh, the Good Samaritan sees the man beaten uh, and lying helplessly in the road, and he has mercy on him. Uh, the word used there in the passage is mercy. And uh, that's exactly what mercy generally means. However, that cannot be the meaning here. Because the misfortune that's described in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, that God is going to meet with his mercy, is one that we have created. It is not one that comes upon us by some other force or actor. We are in a pitiable and helpless state of spiritual deadness and sin. But we have created those sins. We have, we have committed those sins. We've desired to commit them, and we've consented to commit them. We're not in spiritual deadness and sin against our will. Not against our will. It may be true that we were all born in a sin nature, uh, but every sin we commit is a sin we desire and consent to do. Yet still, God hates our spiritual deadness. And he has pity and compassion towards us, even though we have created the mess that we are in. Because he is a God of immeasurable mercy. Immeasurable mercy. He, he's a God of justice and of holiness and of righteousness. He's got immeasurable zeal for his justice and for his holiness and for his righteousness. And that would mean that those things would be against us. But, praise be to the Father that though all of those things are true of him, he looks at the great need we have, though it's self-created, and he has immeasurable mercy for us too. He is a God of immeasurably rich mercy. Not just of immeasurable justice, but of mercy. At the same time that he has anger and wrath against us in our sin, he also has compassion and mercy for us because uh, he sees what he made us to be and what we've become. And the immeasurable nature of his riches means that there's no sin, there's no evil. There's not even the, the smell of our spiritual deadness in his nostrils that can overcome the richness of his mercy. This is how rich he is with mercy. You might think uh, perhaps of a mother who sees a son that has wandered so far away, has ruined his life, has, has broken every dream she had for him. And yet when she sees him, when she sees him, even as maybe the police have to take him home, she still sees that sweet little baby boy. She still sees that, the, the baby that she held in her hands, the boy that she picked up because he was crying when he fell and scraped his knees. But even that mother has a breaking point. Every human mother does. A point where the pain is too great to bear, where the sin is too awful to look at. That breaking point might mean that she abandons her son, might mean that she wants nothing to do with him, might mean that she shuts him out of her life, but it also might just mean that uh, she hasn't abandoned him, but she's abandoned any attempts, attempts to change him. He said no too many times. That breaking point might mean that the mother hasn't abandoned him, but she pretends the son hasn't really, hasn't really done anything that bad, or, or, or he has excuses for it, and, and it's not really his fault. But not so with God. God's immeasurable richness in mercy means that he's able to look at the worst offenses of our sins and, and not back away not try to find a way around it, not try to cover it up. He's able to look at the worst of all of it and he's able to endure that and still be immeasurably merciful. His mercy cannot be quenched. Simply put, his mercy is immeasurable. 
ours is not. And this is exactly what gives all of us great hope, <laughs> miraculous, supernatural hope, immeasurable hope. Not because we have great mercy, not because we have great hope, but because God is immeasurably merciful. We could look at our sons and daughters, our, our grandsons and daughters. We could look at our neighbors, our friends, even our country and our world. And we could know that no person's sins, no family's arrogance, no nation's atrocities, and not even spiritual death itself, not, not even this, can lessen God's immeasurably rich mercy. So perhaps you need to ask yourself tonight, who is it? Who is it that you think has hurt you so badly, has persisted so long, has gone so far, has become so lost, as Pastor Tom mentioned this morning, that your mercy for them maybe has been overcome. Maybe it's a person, maybe it's a community, maybe it's our nation. Trust in the richness of God's mercy. Trust in the richness of God's mercy mercy that he's given to each one of you, uh, even though that's us. But God the Father is immeasurably rich in mercy. It's our first point about but God. This here is a description just of God's nature before we know anything about what he has done. It just describes his nature so that we might take a step back and say as bad as sin is, God is bigger, richer, greater. However, why should we think that his mercy would be applied to us? It's great that he's merciful, but doesn't mean he's merciful to me. Doesn't have to be. Well, the next phrase in Greek in, in verse 4 explains the reason for God's mercy given to us, and that is our second point. But God, but God the Father has overwhelmingly great love for us. But the God the Father has overwhelmingly great love for us. Uh, back in verse 4 again, uh, the word because is there. But God, being rich in mercy, because, NIV goes right into it, but because of his great love. Uh, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Or in the NIV, his great love. The, the reason for his mercy extended toward us was his love for us. That's the reason given. Now, I, I should point out here that most often the word love, and this is agape love here, is used as a verb or is used to describe the action of God on, on the cross uh, where the sacrificial love of God is displayed, where the activity of God's love happens. However, that's not really what the love of God here is describing. The love of God here is describing the love that God has internally within himself for you. Uh, we see that a, a little bit reflected in the language here, which talks about his love, uh, his great love, uh, with which he loved us. Uh, it's, it's somewhat personal, and it's a love that he carries in himself. Uh, but, but it's also the exact same uh, idea that we have from John 3.16. John 3.16. Uh, God so loved that he gave. Uh, his love was a condition within himself and his giving came out of his love for us. Uh, the two cannot be separated, but in this passage we're emphasizing the love God has within himself. But we should then ask, looking at the objects of his love, looking at that, we should ask as we read verses 1 through 3, if the reason for God saving us was a love he had before we were saved, a love that we had even though, verse 5, we were dead in transgressions, uh, 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 even when we were following the ways of a world ruled by Satan and could therefore be called satanic, verse 2, even when we were rebelling against God's ways and truth in favor of our own passions and our own truth, verse 3, and even when we were children of wrath, also in verse 3. How could God love that? 
How could God have love within himself for that? It doesn't make any sense. What about us did God love if, if this is what we have become? And if God's own wrath was ready to punish us with an eternal punishment in hell as we were children of wrath? Well, the reason that Scripture gives us is, again, I think analogous to a parent's relationship with his child. A father may have a daughter who's wasted her life in loose living, who's abandoned the faith, who's had children out of wedlock to different fathers, has become addicted even to heroin, and God help him. He must confess that when he sees his daughter now, he at times at least is filled with anger, with shame, with disappointment, and perhaps even disgust at his own daughter. But he still has love in his heart for her. But he can still see his little girl. He could still remember putting her on his shoulders. He could still remember tickling her till she giggles. He, he could still remember cuddling up with her on the couch. He, he can't forget those things. He still looks through pictures from time to time of his daughter growing up and can't help but smile even if it's through tears. For God, we are his creation. We're wonderfully and fearfully made. He has deep and affectionate and fatherly love for us. He loves us as his image bearers that reflect his glory, and he loves us because he just is an incredibly loving God. But he also, too, hates our sinful acts and our sinful state. He's grieved and he burns with anger about our sins against him. And even he says to us is filled with disgust because of us. And our sins against God are much more serious than any sins a daughter can commit against her dad or against herself. They're infinitely worse. Paint the worst picture you can and paint the worst picture you can imagine uh, of a daughter's wild and rebellious and hard-hearted sins against a father and other people, and you'll not come anywhere close to the measure of the sin that we have committed against God. And that is what he is looking at. People who have corrupted and blasphemed and perverted the almighty, infinite, all-glorious God. Nevertheless, but... He still has overwhelming, great love for us. And please note in the passage how this love is described. The quality of it is emphasized in these verses. First of all, the NIV again tries to clean up the language, but in the Greek, it, it reads just like the ESV. Um, because of his great love with which he loved us. Love is repeated twice. It's repeated as a noun and then as a verb. Uh, it, it's emphasized here. And again, it's personalized, his love for us. And then, of course, it's added on to that. It's, it's his great love, his great love with which he loved us. Indeed, the greatness of God's love, just like his mercy, is also infinite is also unchangeable, is also inexhaustible. A.W. Tozer has a quote, and this quote is about God's grace, but the, the same applies to his love, so I'm going to change grace to love in the quote, but I, I love this quote, one of my favorite quotes. A.W. Tozer says in The Knowledge of the Holy, speaking of God's grace, to abound in sin, that is the worst and the most we could or can do, the word abound defines the limit of our finite abilities. And although we feel our iniquities rise over us like a mountain, the mountain nevertheless has definable boundaries. It's so large, so high, it weighs only this certain amount and no more. But who shall define the limitless love 
of God. It's much more plunges our thoughts into infinitude and confounds them there. All thanks be to God for love abounding. Just as Pastor Tom again has been pointing out to us in the parables of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son, <laughs> paint the worst picture you can imagine. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how he or she got there, paint the worst picture you can imagine. Walk down the awful history of, of the worst people a spiritually dead history of mankind has produced. And the overwhelmingly great love of God, the Creator, for that person has not diminished in the least. It is not. It cannot be diminished because it's overwhelmingly great. It is not overwhelmed by anything. It is the one, the thing that overwhelms others. No matter, no matter how overwhelmingly great the sin is, God's love cannot be overcome. And if because of his overwhelmingly great love for us, if because of his overwhelming, overwhelmingly great love for that one, if he determines to find and save that one, nothing will be able to hide her from him. She will not even be able to hide herself. Right? She will sweep the floor clean, the dirt floor, right? The, the grass floor. God's great love cannot be exhausted. And if he acts on his love, he will never stop until she is found and she's brought back to life. And that's exactly what God does because of his love for those of faith. Because of his overwhelmingly great love and because of his immeasurable riches in mercy, our third point, God the Father gives spiritual life when we were spiritually dead. God the Father gives gave us spiritual life when we were spiritually dead. Uh, here uh, we see in verse 5, even, the phrase, even when we were dead in our trespasses. And again here the, the phrases are flipped, and I, I like the NIV puts that later. Uh, the NIV starts with made us alive together with Christ. But uh, I, I like, in the Greek, again, it starts with even. And, and the, the point here being that you have all these things stacked on top of each other, building up to a point that makes uh, the love and mercy and act of God in saving us reach a climax because it is because of his rich mercy. It's because of his great love, even when we were dead, that he made us alive. It, everything stacks and, and comes together. And remember, as we saw in verses 1 through 3, even when we were dead, that, that we were spiritually dead, all of us, all of the human race. Uh, we were souls that were ruled by Satan, that followed the ways of the world, that followed our own thinking, that uh, plunged ourselves in all that the sin nature uh, wanted us to do. Maybe not all the way in all the different sins we could have done, but we followed after uh, our sinful hearts. Again, that, that's the ellipsis. Uh, that is the great history of mankind and of ourselves. But the, the action of God here in verse 5 is that but God, even when we were dead, made us alive. He made us alive. This is a supernatural act of God uh, by which he saves us. Being spiritually dead means that you cannot get out of this realm. Uh, you cannot uh, raise yourself back up to where Adam was. Spiritually dead things cannot give themselves spiritual life. Spiritual life does not come from spiritual death. And we would not have sought it either. Corpses don't move. They don't dance. They don't sing. They don't call out in faith and you were a spiritual corpse. Sermons can't help them. Evangelism can't help them. Billy Graham can't help them. Yelling, arguing, loving them can't help them. They need life. They need spiritual life. 
and that life has to come from above. It has to come from God who reaches down to those sinners and he gives them spiritual life. It's a supernatural act of God whereby he changes everything that we know by giving life from above, by changing us so that we might seek him, we might have faith, we might love him. And this act of God's love for us is an act we cannot create. We recognize we're dependent on God to do it. And he has told us he will do it through the preached word. He's told us he will do it through our evangelism. He has told us that he will do it through us, which is a great privilege that we have but we cannot create it. It's unlike a uh, kind of funny article here by um, Babylon B, which says, uh, local woman lovingly nags unsaved husband into kingdom. It says this, uh, heeding scriptural admonitions found somewhere in First Peter, local wife Vanessa Brandon decided to adopt a more spiritual approach, approach of constantly badgering her husband, Thomas, on previously tabled discussions related to God, the gospel, and going to yet another weekday Bible study group until he finally gave in and accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and entered the kingdom of God as a born-again Christian. All right, enough, get off my back. See, I prayed the prayer. Thomas could be heard yelling after the Holy Spirit entered his heart. Now lay off me! Vanessa's struggle to make her husband think about God or Christianity at all has been stymied as she tried to win him over without a word by her actions. But something was missing. Quote, I realized that when I had asked him things before, he was either ignoring me or forgetting what I just said. So when I decided to keep bringing things up over and over and over again, you know, as a gentle but firm reminder, I found that this did the trick and won him over almost right away. Even I thought I might be getting annoying, but the results don't lie. At publishing time, Vanessa was found to be thinking of multiple household chores and events she could begin nagging her husband about. <laughs> Right? We believe that spiritual life is something only God can do, and we're dependent upon Him to do it. And God has done this as we are raised to life. We are given life with Christ, made us alive together with Christ. This is actually a word, I don't have time to go into it, but this is a word that Paul just kind of made up. We don't see it anywhere else ever. Okay, uh, he uses it one other time, but this is a unique word to Paul. Made us alive together with is the word. And this made us to alive together with Christ is a word that means that we are identified with Christ. Because we identify with Christ in his physical resurrection, we are then given spiritual resurrection. Uh, we're given new life. And this is an act of God in love that is based on his, the love he has within himself, but it's a love that he does not act upon for everyone. He doesn't act upon for everyone. And that, of course, would make us ask the question, why us, why me? What was the basis for me being made alive while others were passed by? Why is it that God raised this person to spiritual life and left the others? We get the answer in verse in our final point. But God the Father saved us on the basis of his amazing grace. But God the Father saved us on the basis of his amazing grace. We recognize when we look at this that God's mercy, that he is immeasurably rich in, we do not deserve. We could never deserve. God is simply merciful in and of himself because that is who he is. We recognize we are not victims of sin. We are sin, and we willingly and gladly and uh, without much hesitation commit sin that we've created, mankind has created its need for mercy, and we don't deserve it. We recognize that God's love toward us and his creation, uh, even as his image bearers, is not deserved. After all, we didn't even create ourselves, and after all, the the image of God in us is not unique to us because of who we are individually. The image of God is created from God. 
We don't deserve God's love, the love that he has within himself for you and I. It's a love that is all about his own creation and his own image in us. In fact, we recognize when we look at this, what this means is that the only thing that we really deserved, because we were full of sin, because we were ruled by Satan, because we were spiritually dead, was the result of all those things, were the result of a sinful and satanic and spiritually dead judgment. But God, but God, through immeasurably great love, through an inexhaustible richness and mercy, though he was infinitely angered at our sins, by grace, by his own grace, reached out to you and I, made us alive. purely of his own gracious choosing. Put whatever you want in this ellipsis. doesn't matter. Put whatever person you want in that ellipsis. Put uh, any era of mankind's history and all of it together in that ellipsis. It doesn't matter because of these two words but God. But God is rich in mercy. But God has overwhelming love for us. But God, by his grace, through his Son, makes dead things live again. Made us live again. Let's pray. Father God, we, we recognize how amazing your gospel is for us. We, we don't like to look at it, but we see ourselves in sin. And, and we weep, Lord, and not just for ourselves, but for others we know. We weep. We were so far gone. We were so lost. But Lord, you have limitless wealth and mercy. Father, you have overcoming, overwhelming great love and by your grace and a decision that we'll never maybe know why purely because of your gracious choice you looked upon us and you gave us life you looked upon us lying there like spiritually dead corpses and you put us up on our feet opened our eyes, gave us a, a heart, a faith, a mind to understand what this means that you love us, what it means that we can be saved, and you did it. You did it. So that all that we have to say the rest of our lives, the rest of eternity, are these two words, but God, but God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen.